I have the privilege of introducing our next uh, speaker. Um, the speaker will deliver a what is sure to be a really, really interesting uh, lecture, but also a very, very, very uh, amazing uh, study with a, a cupping and a, and a tasting to follow. Um, <laughs> the uh, yeah, the introduction is pretty good. It's pretty rich. Uh, I'm going to paraphrase a little bit, if that's okay. Yeah, Please um, do. It's full of cuss words. It's amazing. It, you um, know, I had to get them all out sometime. Yeah. Um, so our next speaker uh, got his first job at a coffee roaster at Barefoot Coffee uh, right around 2004. Yeah, yeah, that seems about right. It's bad form for you to be speaking before you've been properly introduced, but... It's okay. You're looking over here and asking it's me true. questions. It's true. It's true. Bad yeah. form of the MC You're, so, you're just to supposed to, to quietly nod. You know what? Uh, Shut yeah. up over there, okay? <laughs> Fine. Um, after finishing his degree in 2007, uh, he worked for Verve Coffee Roasters uh, in Santa Cruz, California, and was a technician for Fer Four Barrel Coffee, where I work at now. Um, and in 2010, he uh, joined the La Marzocco USA team uh, where Scott led an internal program to understand water chemistry and its effect on brewing and brewing equipment. Um, so without further ado, the product manager for La Marzocco USA, Scott Guglielmino. Thanks, Jay. All right, guys. So what we are here talking about today, I find one of the most interesting things there is. Really, and I got into it because of a different way than I think most people would get into water. Um, the most telling thing about water chemistry, if we go back to yesterday, my favorite thing about our first slide was, I know I needed this really expensive piece of equipment because, I put, because Tim put something in something and it tells me I need to spend $10,000. That is most of our relationship with water. And furthering our relationship with water is the way that we're going to further our relationship with coffee and brew better coffee. So, to talk about that, first thing we need to do is talk about what our goals are with water. Really simple. Have very tasty coffee and have a really healthy machine. And I got into and have understood water primarily because of the latter part, the healthy machine. At La Marzocco, we had a problem in Cambridge, Massachusetts. We had seven machines that had failed boilers. That's more machines than the rest of the world, in the rest of the United States combined. And we wanted to know why. And this was about three years ago. And I got sent on my very way to figure out why we were having that problem. And through that, here I am three years later, and I feel like I have a very good understanding of water and how we can make it better. So, the first thing we need to do whenever we're having a conversation about water is talk about four key terms. These key terms are our foundation. This is what we need to understand if we're going to be able to talk about the chemistry of water and then also to address it well. So we're going to start off on the most important one. TDS. TDS is very simple. I think most of us know what it means. It stands for total dissolved solids. What are total dissolved solids? Pretty self-explanatory. It's the amount of stuff that is dissolved in our water. This just gives us an overview or a snapshot of what is there. It doesn't really tell us too much about what is what. It just says, hey, there's stuff in the water. We're not going to tell you what it is, but it's really cheap and easy to understand. Everybody's seen conductivity meters? Those little TDS meters that we use are measuring the electrical resistance of water. All the stuff in water is what passes the electricity. So by measuring how much electricity gets through those meters, we can figure out how much stuff is in our water. Once we have this overview of what's, what's, how much stuff is in our water, we want to start diving in. The first thing we're going to talk about is it really is important to the coffee and espresso machine world. Basically, any time you get water hot, hardness is important. Hardness is a measurement of two things, temporary and permanent hardness. Together, they form total hardness. Temporary hardness. Slide back a second. Rain falls. There's carbon dioxide in the air. That carbon dioxide reacts with the rainfall. When the water reacts with rainfall, it creates an acid. When that acid gets into the ground, 
it is going to react with the mineral, minerals, the metals specifically in the ground, and absorb some of them. Going to be calcium carbonate, magnesium carbonate, all of these things, those common words that we hear, calcium carbonate, that's one we hear all the time. That's really a measure of how much minerals the water is sucked up due to that reaction of carbon dioxide being absorbed into rainfall after it's hit the ground. So with that, we want to look at temporary and permanent hardness. Temporary hardness is really the fascinating one. That's what happens when you boil water, what gets left behind. That is all the temporary hardness. Permanent hardness, that's what remains in the water even when you do boil it. So, with that, pH. pH is really, really cool because we're measuring the potential of something being there. We're looking for free hydrogen versus hydroxide ions. The potential of them being there. If everybody remembers high school chemistry, if you look up at the top left-hand corner of the periodic table, that hydrogen atom. City there, it's the, one of the most reactive ones, all by its lonesome. With it, the more hydrogen we have in the water, the more it's going to want to react with everything around it. The same thing with hydroxide. They're basically the negative inverse of hydrogen. So with that, we can say with the more hydrogen or the more hydroxide, the more our water is going to react with what's around it. And as you go further and further on the scale, starting at a, a point of, zero, of seven, that is balance, you're going to continue going. And when we talk about the scale normally, it's zero to 14. Technically, the scale's infinite. But for the range of coffee, we're going to really squish it down from about 6.75 to 7.75 is going to be our really healthy coffee range. Anything outside of that in our water is just too reactive. Too reactive to too much of anything else. Now we get to what probably has to be the most confusing of the terms. <sighs> Alkalinity. What is it? What does it do? Well, it's going to be one of the most important things in coffee brewing, and we'll get to that in a minute, because the tasty coffee part is clearly what we're here for. But alkalinity. How basic is the water? Doesn't that have to do with the pH is normally the confusion. Well, alkalinity, very simple. It is the amount of bicarbonate in the water. That amount of bicarbonate keeps the pH from changing. Before we change pH, we have to deal with these bicarbonates that are hanging out. So, alkalinity is a buffer. If you look at the temperature of a room, alkalinity is how much energy it takes to change that temperature. It's just hanging out and you gotta get it out of the way before you can mess with the pH. And brewing coffee, as it turns out, we're using a solvent with a solute. Water's our solvent and coffee's our solute. So, what we wanna do is pull out a bunch of acids, which will change the pH of our solvent. So, we have to deal with the alkalinity first. We have to get that out of the way. So, going full circle, we're back to tasty coffee, healthy machines. If we want tasty coffee and healthy machines, we have to really understand that solvent-solute relationship. How the interaction happens and how we can optimize that for our coffee, our solute. So, what makes tasty coffee? A really good solvent that doesn't have anything else in it. Let's look at the solvent part first. What's actually going on when we're brewing? This is my favorite thing ever. The transient phase of brewing is super fascinating. This is done really quickly, but it defines your whole brew process. This is when the coffee particle takes on water and swells. You can see our nice little coffee particle swelling there. And as it does that, all of the soluble things inside the coffee malt ground, most of those are acids start to go into solution with our water. And they start to travel to the exterior of the coffee ground. That rate of travel is just the most critical thing. That's gonna define how long it takes for us to sweep everything away with the water. First thing the water does is act as a solvent. And then it's just a medium for carrying away all those tasty acids. Really those acids are the tasty nuggets that make coffee great. And we wanna get those out as quickly as we can because the longer we have our solvent in contact with our solute, the more chance we have of beginning to pick up those nasty, undesirable things that happen in longer brewing times. 
So, having the fastest extraction possible is critical. Well, what controls that extraction rate? Alkalinity. Lower alkalinity helps with a faster extraction in that transient phase, just getting it right to the surface of the coffee. With that, we need to then look at one other thing. The alkalinity controlled extraction rate. With this, we need to figure out what is good, what is too much, and what is too little. Because as it turns out, there are a couple other reactions that occur. We begin to release CO2. And CO2 has another huge effect, especially on pressurized brewing, or espresso. That is what helps create the resistance of the coffee cake. Also, it helps create the resistance of the coffee bed for brewing. So with this, we need to be able to release some CO2, some nice little pops getting in the way of our tasty nuggets of acids coming out into our solvent. So with that, how do we do that? Well, as it turns out, we need some alkalinity. We're honing in on a magic number here. This is the range that makes tasty coffee. Alkalinity is the key to that range. If we're between 30 and 50 parts per million of bicarbonates of alkalinity, we're going to be set up to brew some really tasty coffee. Awesome. So, we have that. But there was one other thing I talked about. We have a good solvent. We know that key thing about our solvent that we need to have it be really good. I also mentioned impurities. Everybody remember that. <sighs> impurities are this really nasty bugger. As it turns out, we all want health safe, healthy and safe drinking water. When I have water that I pull out of my faucet, I want to be able to have a glass of it. I don't want to have to worry about if there's Giardia or E. coli in it. And to help with that, my city water department puts chlorine in the water. It kills all those nasty things. I'm really glad for that because I don't want Giardia. However, chlorine doesn't make coffee taste good. It gets in the way. So, we need to remove those impurities. There's a huge list of impurities. The biggest one though is chlorine. And that's a great thing to have in our water as long as we strip it out before we use it to make our final product. For a great reference on what those impurities are and how to remove them, if you go to the Water Quality Association's handbook on water conditioning, you're going to find a great 10-page reference of every single water impurity and how to remove it. It's all right there. There's no magic secret to it. Find out what you have. Sometimes you can even go by, is it an odor? Is it a color? And it will be listed off for you. You put on the right conditioning media, and it will be taken care of. So, we have a good solvent. We have a really good solvent. We have good balance to it. We have the right amount of alkalinity. We have no impurities. So, as the guy from the machine world, we're about to get into the thing that I really care about. Making sure that you have a healthy machine. Because you've spent a lot of money on it. And we want it to last for a long time. And we're going to take a step back here. When you're making metal, whether it be brass or steel, you're going to take all your ores, heat them up, and then cast them into whatever it is. And you may do other machining processes from there. But it always involves getting ore hot and then creating your complex metal. As it turns out, we put a lot of energy creating that metal, keeping it from being an ore. Everything wants to go back. All metal is eventually going to go back to its natural state of being an ore. So what I'm saying is, everyone dies, everything breaks, and all metal will eventually corrode. It's okay. It's about how long that takes to happen. And controlling that is really easy. We have very sophisticated metals. We know what we're doing with it, but we have to be very, very particular about our solvent. So, with that in mind, makes the machine healthy. It's going to be balanced. So with that, we know that everything's going to fail eventually. And also there's another thing that happens to occur. In Seattle, it's one of my favorite techs in town has this great t-shirt, scale is the enemy. It is in a lot of ways. I know my first time I had a problem as a barista on bar, the groups had different flow rates. The technician came and looked at it and he wasn't able to figure out what was going on. I just said that shots taste different on each group. He said, well, the pressure is the same 
and it's coming out of the same boiler, so you're crazy. It turns out there was this little flow restrictor that had scale formed on it. That scale changed the flow rate between the two groups. When you change the flow rate, you're going to change the coffee. So, controlling scale is a very critical thing. The other thing that scale will get in the way of is efficiency. Efficiency is a big thing, hot topic, big fancy word in the espresso machine industry right now. Scale really detracts from efficiency. When you have to heat up a big blanket of metal that's coating your heating element before you heat up your water, of course it's not going to be quite as quick as we would like it to be. So, that's one side of the spectrum. On the other, we have corrosion. Controlling that natural thing that's always going to happen. So, there are a couple key things that define at what rate these metals will corrode. pH of a solution, that reactivity. The amount of oxygen adjacent to your metal. The specific nature and concentration of other ions. And flag that one in your mind. We're going to be coming back to it. It's one that really became important for me. Here's the next one, and in my mind, the most interesting of them all. The ability of the environment to, for, for, per, to create a protective layer between the metal and a solvent. Hmm. It seems like that's a protective layer to me. So, if we're trying to keep this from happening, maybe this isn't the worst thing in the world. A lot of technicians are going to hate me because they hate scale. And I don't necessarily hate it all the time. Some scale is really good. A small amount. Because at the end of the day, if we know all metal will corrode, and we know putting a nice little buffer between our metal and our water is going to extend the life of our metal, well, shit, I want to do that. So, how do we find out how to put the right amount of scale on the wall of our boiler? Not too much, not too little. Well, we are going to go back to Tasty Coffee and Healthy Machines. We know what corrodes, we know what scales, we know what's a good solvent, we know what the impurities are. So bringing it all the way, full circle, we're going to get really crazy here. We're going to look for balance. Now please, if you go on Wikipedia this instant, and you type in Langley or Saturation Index, they will tell you it is a great tool for calculating water's tendency to create or dissolve scale. Technically, this is not a measure of corrosion. Technically, we don't need to be that scientific about it. As it turns out, if you're making a multi-billion dollar nuclear power plant, and if your water corrodes your pipes, you kind of have a major disaster. You care about the minutia. In my experience, the LSI has been 100% predictive in what will be corrosive water and what will not be. So let's just take a breath, except that we're going to use something a little bit off from what it should be. Other people use it too, just this way. It'll work really well. So what is the LSI? Tells us if scale forms or not. Came about in 1936. Dr. Langlier, UC Berkeley professor, wanted to find out how scale will form in, in, in municipal pipes. What he did was test the chemistry, find out how reactive the water is. And that's the pH minus the pH in equilibrium, when you take everything into account. And you'll find a number. That number will handily, for the most non-reactive, hey, I'm just going to chill out and do nothing, water, it'll be zero. As you get dissolving scale, or probably hurting the metal around it, you're going to start to see negative numbers. Negative two, negative three being extremely likely to dis damage metal around it. If you go on the positive side, well, this is where we get to the number we want to know. This is it. This is the magic ticket. 0.2 to 0.7. Everybody who's taking notes, write that down. That's the one key thing you need. If you have that number, you're going to be forming scale slow enough 
that you're not going to hurt your espresso machine, but also you're going to be forming enough scale that you're not going to have to worry about the water hurting the metal. Awesome. So, now all we have to do is something really simple. Figure out what the LSI is. Yep. So, um, super easy. I do this stuff in my sleep all the time, totally. Um, as it turns out, we live in a beautiful time. There's a thing called a smartphone, and those things called smartphones have these great things called apps on them. For a buck, you can get an app that calculates the LSI. Or if you wait, and starting in about a month or two, when you buy your next Marzocco, you're going to get little five test kits in it. And then you go to lamarzocco.com backslash water calculator, and there'll be this, which is awesome. You put in your numbers, and it spits out the result. This is what you need to work from. If you have a LSI higher than 0.7, you know you need to reduce the scaling property of your water. If you have an LSI below 0.2, you know you need to add more scaling power to your water. So with that, we're going to look at that one asterisk I told you about. That thing, that little tiny thing of other impurities. Well, chlorides are the other impurity that I found. It turns out the city of Cambridge, Massachusetts, salts their roads. The roads all are around their drinking water supply. All the salt runs into their drinking water supply. They're drinking salt water. And as it turns out, salt water doesn't like metal. They don't get along. And with that, we were able to find out exactly why the city of Cambridge was able to do more damage to our boilers than the rest of the United States combined the salt in your water. And with that, the other thing to always keep in mind is aggressive water. This is what gets really scary. Any metal is not pure. It has other stuff in it. Nickel, lead, all those nasty things. We don't want to ingest those. As you have water that's more reactive down that LSI scale, more and more likely you will be to have water that will pull out those nasty things that aren't too good for us and put it into the water that you'll be drinking. So always think, is there a chance of nickel and lead? Is the formulation of the metal that my machine is made of involved with those things? Potentially. If so, how do I reduce that and make sure your LSI is in the correct range? So back, favorite thing. We know good water, we know bad water. We know what's a good solvent, what's a bad solvent. We know how to make coffee with it. How do we change our LSI value? Well, this is the important thing. We need to get some informed action. So that informed action, how do we do it? Well, we're going to test our water. Awesome. So testing water, really simple, really easy. There are three different types of testing. Simple dipsticks, titration, and digital meters. Depending on who you are, depends on which one you should be using. And also, depending on where you are, depends on how often you should be testing. In most municipalities in the states, they change water seasonally, three to four times a year. With that, you know you want to test your water at least three to four times a year. Because what's the correct conditioning at one point in the year may not be correct at another point in the year. I worked in one place where half the year we had the perfect SCAA, SCAE specification of water. Awesome. Unfortunately, the other half of the year, we had the hardest water that our testing labs had ever tested. Well, that was a problem for half of the year because we didn't test it until our machine had completely scaled which clearly cause problems. So, test strips. If you're a cafe owner, they're very simple. They're really cheap. They're disposable. We're going to start giving them away with our machines because they're so cheap and easy to use. But, technicians, titration test kits are way more accurate. Those test strips don't give you a number. They give you a range. A actual titration test kit will give you a number. 
you can get a much more stable, much clearer understanding of what your water has in it with titration test kits. And then, if you're buying a filter from somebody, make sure they're using really good instrument-based systems to test your water. That's gonna be really expensive, really hard to keep calibrated, but man oh man does it make testing easy and give you really great, very accurate results. So, again, full circle, tasty coffee, healthy machines. We know how to test, we know what we're testing for, we know why we're testing for it, we're almost done. We have all of these things in place. We're at the last step, conditioning. This is the actual, what are we doing to our water? Well, we're gonna be doing one of three things. The first one is addition. With addition, we're working with waters that need something else added. Two main types. One is water that, in that LSI range that may be negative, where we wanna boost up the metal level, where we wanna add some calcium carbonate. We're gonna use something called calcite. Calcite's a trade name for calcium carbonate, limestone. All we're gonna do is put a bunch of powdered up limestone in a container and slowly feed it into our machine. Now there, it's not always perfect. None of these things that we're gonna be talking about conditioning are always perfect every time. But that's how we're gonna to start to raise alkalinity, raise TDS, and raise pH. Calcite does a lot for us, it's really useful. The other one is polyphosphates. Polyphosphates are really interesting and we're getting to a point that they may become really applicable to what we're doing right now in a couple years. And they're really right on the cutting edge. Polyphosphates are this really cool thing. They say, hey, there's a calcium carbonate piece of scale all dissolved hanging out in our water. I'm gonna go grab onto it and not let it stick to anything and let it just pass on through the espresso machine. That's awesome. The only problem is they've always been limited by temperature. Traditionally above 60 degrees Celsius, they fall out of solution. They form a nice little slime at the bottom of your boiler. They're beginning to become polyphosphates on the market that may work long enough at high enough temperatures so they're at use, that they're useful in espresso machines. And they're just now coming onto the market. So keep an eye on those. They'll help your machine, they may not help the taste of your coffee, but if you're just looking for your machine's longevity, they'll help, they'll keep scale from forming. So, next up, subtraction. I'm guessing everybody here has boiled water, added dried noodles, and strained it, right? So, you have done that style of filtration. All you're doing is straining something. Now, there are two types of subtraction. One is that mechanical filtration, the making pasta, throwing something through a strainer. The other one is absorption. Absorption is really fun. That is my favorite thing in the water conditioning world. Activated carbon. Activated carbon is kind of like a piece of Velcro. If anything runs by it in a certain size range, in a certain reactivity range, it just hooks on. Chlorine. That little nasty bugger, really easy to get rid of, because it just latches onto the Velcro that is activated carbon. So, two types of subtracting things from your water. One, the absorption, the other one, actual mechanical screen removal. With that, reverse osmosis, that's gonna be that highest degree of filtration. That's taken to that hyper degree. That's when you're only letting hydrogen and oxygen those nice little water molecules through. Everything else is being mechanically removed. So with that, exchange. This is always the interesting one. This is always the difficult one. What are we doing? Well, we're trying to play a little trick with our water here. We're taking our reactive scale forming calcium carbonate. We're gonna use a catalyst. Somebody who says, hey, let's hang out for a minute. Grab him and shoot something else in the water instead. Uh, usually with that, it's gonna be something that doesn't form scale at the same rate. When we do that, we're able to limit the scale. We still have all the stuff in the water. We still don't have a perfect solvent, but, again, we have a much healthier espresso machine. And if that's all you're looking for, the box for a healthy espresso machine is much wider than the box for really good tasting coffee. So with that, Oslo, in specific, here, Oslo water is really fun for me 
because it's almost identical to where I live now, Seattle. Seattle and Oslo water are nearly identical. And they're kind of difficult because there's not much you can do. You can add a little bit of calcite to your water, but calcite doesn't feed perfectly evenly. You're going to get not quite exactly what you're signing up for. You're basically kind of going to get stuck. But luckily, the water isn't too bad. You have enough hardness, you have enough alkalinity, that you're going to brew really good coffee. You may try and play around a little bit with calcite, but be very careful. Too much calcite means you're going to have a whole lot of scale issues. It's not going to evenly feed, because you need to evenly feed water through the limestone to get an even amount of water out of the limestone, calcite out of the limestone. So, with that, we're going to do the fun part now. What we've set up is six different filter coffees and three different espressos. The six filter coffees, we're going to have water, Oslo tap water, that's gone through taste and odor filter, that activated carbon filter. Next up, we're going to do perfect SCAEA, SCAEE, WBC water. And then we're going to do water that is too hard, too rich in minerals. Now we're going to do another three in there, three more filters. One that is gone through a reverse osmosis system, but has been over demineralized. So water that has a very, 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 very low, even below Oslo level, amount of minerals to it. Water that goes through a weak acid softener, so one style of softener, and then we're going to go through another style of softener called a sodium softener. The difference between the two. One of them pulls out alkalinity. That's going to be that weak acid softener. Um, WAC, WAC, for those. The other one is sodium ion exchange. That's going to be the trading the calcium for the sodium molecules. We're going to see some really interesting results for the filter coffee. And then from there, we're going to see three different espressos. One that's undermineralized water, one that is, again, that SCIA, SCIE, WBC specification water, and then one that is overmineralized. And then we're going to come back and we're all going to taste, uh, talk about what we tasted. Sound good? Awesome. When you're done with this, make sure you thank the national teams. They are making like 1,800 beverages for you guys right now so that we can all do this. It's a lot of work for them, and uh, I'm really, really stoked that we get to have such a diverse tasting going on. So thank you very much, and we'll talk back here in a couple minutes. Okay. So we're going to bring uh, Scott back up, and we're also going to bring up Ronnie. And we're going to discuss uh, both flights of coffees that we just tasted. So please come on in, have a seat. All right. Three. Test three. So Jay, while we're waiting for everybody to sit down. Yep. Yes. Yep. Do you have any thoughts on it? On the cupping, filter coffee? Um, Don't give too much away, but did you taste some differences? There was some definite differences. Um, Things did not all taste the same? No, they didn't. Um, there were some that were downright awful. Perfect. Yeah. So I think that, uh, I don't think that it's debatable that water quality is uh, a, a big factor in what happens. So, uh, I'm curious to see what, uh, what the reveal is. The big reveal. Yeah. So everybody, let's, uh, another big round of applause for Scott and Ronnie here. Espresso first. All right, uh, so guys, to get started, let's just do a really simple show of hands. Who preferred espresso number one? Who preferred espresso number two and espresso three? Very interesting. So, are we ready for the big reveal? So, with our two, uh, our two MCs, can 
Somebody tell me why they preferred the espresso that they did. So start off with the number that you preferred and then why. Yeah, I, uh, I preferred the first one. I thought it was um, uh, just uh, bright. I thought it was a little dry on the finish, um, but I thought it was uh, the mouthfeel was a little bit better than the other two. Okay, good mouthfeel. Right. Anybody prefer number two? Oh, wait, are we going num one, two, three? Uh, yeah. yeah, since we had number one start, then yeah, why don't we Let's do who number, two. number two? I was just wondering if we wanted to go to number, another person who had like number one. But. Yeah. Uh, does anybody else, number no. one, want to share a couple comments on it? Anybody else? Okay, number two. Sorry. All right, who had their hands up for uh, liking number two? Here we go. I'm sorry? Right. Is that, is that a taking no, a picture? No, take, that's oh, a taking okay. a picture. I think there's a, there's a person right there who will uh, answer our question for us right behind you, Jay. Oh, perfect. It was just well balanced. It was not too much of this and not too much of that. It was <laughs> right in the middle. <laughs> so, um, it doesn't hurt like the first or the sec uh, third one. The Goldilocks shot. Yeah, yeah it was. Okay, and who had their hand up for preferring shot three? Who wants to talk about shot three? Gabe? Uh, I, yeah, I guess it's the lesser of three evils. I mean, there's uh, more clarity in the acidity of the three, and um, none were particularly good, but I'd say that was the best one. <laughs> to be completely honest. <laughs> okay. Anybody else that was a fan of number three? Somebody else raise their hand? Yep, got one. Yeah, um, I agree on, on what he said. It's, uh, it has uh, the brightest acidity. It's kind of soft. Uh, it's, uh, it feels like a dark roast, so uh, I think this water was uh, the best one with it. it. Yeah, bright, kind of sweet, but still dark, dark roast. Perfect. Great. So let's talk about filter for coffee for a second, then we'll move on to Q&A after we talk about filter. Sounds okay. good. Awesome. So starting with the first three of our filter, I forgot to do the blind raising of hands. My apologies. <laughs> number one. Number two. Number three. Number four, number five, oh, no, sorry. and number six. Really interesting. So, first three, high mineral level. Who is a fan of number one? I, I thought it was the most balanced and pleasant in the mouth. Most balanced, pleasant in the mouth, number right. one. Okay. For number two? Yes, uh, for me it was uh, Swedish coffee and um, with the best acidity, uh, best balance. Number three. Here we go. Um, yeah, I like three best. It had the uh, best mouthfeel for my part. Um, even some, some sweetness. It was very similar to two to me. But yeah. What's the best of the six I taste it? Some sweetness and quite good acidity. Perfect. So with that, let's see again who liked number four, who liked number five, and number six. So very small group of people. So first one, anybody want to share some descriptors on this? Who liked number four best? Okay, coming back here. Uh, please share what you thought of the coffee. It's a really, really uh, citrus for me. And this coffee, number four. Different? Months? Um, yeah, it had a high acidity. Um, maybe it was, uh, it felt like it was a lower extraction as well, maybe. All right. Uh, but uh, yeah, high, high acidity, nice. When you say treated with RO, does that mean that you've taken out all of the... Yes, it was down to 25 parts per million of actual minerals in our final brew. So that means it had almost nothing in it. 
Right. So it, it started out at 450 exactly. parts per million, but you had RO'd it. Yes. Down All the way down to, and this would actually be an incorrectly calibrated RO. This is down in the negative LSI range. So this would be a water that we would consider to be fairly corrosive and not great for our machine. But if we really liked it and we liked paying for machines, we'd go ahead and do yeah, that. Please, okay. please. I will not stop you from buying more machines. <laughs> uh, number five? Who liked number five? Okay. No big fans of five? Oh. No, I kind of like the mouthfeel and the sweetness. That was All it. right. And then number six. Who liked number six? I don't think I... Oh, well, there was one. Right over there. Jay, behind oh. you. Oh. Um, it had the most red fruits and nice sweetness I liked. And it was, again, the, for me, the most balanced one. It was low to medium body and not so much acidity like the one before, but it was balanced and nice red fruits and sweetness. Awesome. Thank you. So, with that, um, you want to introduce Ronnie, who's standing beside me here? Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, Ronnie has a list of certifications long enough that uh, I can't do it without having a note card in front of me. You got them all? You, you got you? one yeah. or two. Yeah, one or two. I'm sorry, I, uh, I'm going through the same thing here. Okay. Yeah. So, Ronnie is uh, for working with Pentair and Everpure. Uh, he is a WQA certified water specialist, um, level four. Is yeah. that correct? That's correct. amazing. Uh, works that actually for comes with a belt. It does. <laughs> good, good. I was going to ask that, but I didn't want to be rude. Uh -huh. so. um, uh, he is a, a key account manager for Pentair. So a uh, big round of apl applause for Ronnie here. Yeah. These two gentlemen together will now uh, will go into a water discussion um, uh, leading up to a, a Q and A. Great. Great. I mean, I think we're ready just for the Q and A. Okay. Yep. Yep. Perfect. <laughs> All right. Yep. We've discussed water a lot. Yep. Yeah. All right. Jenny. I was wondering how the SCA WBC. Um, specs were determined and who determined them and when? <laughs> so that's a very interesting one. I believe the SCAA specs were written first. Uh, the most I can find, and it looks like they were written in combination by a, a team of people, correct? Yeah. Um, it was uh, different labs, mainly US based, who did uh, taste test performances. And I found out that the, the range between 100 and 150 ppms in the water came out with the best results on taste, balance, and everything around. So this is what a little bit was set as a standard, also starting up of the world championships to create a standard for everyone. This was accepted. Now if you look at the ideals, Europe and US not always are agreeing on that, so we keep the doors open, and it's continuously reviewed to optimize. Let's say it's going to yeah. be a little bit wider. Yes. Yeah, I have a question about scale. Um, we recently started turning our espresso machine off at night, and is that going to be a big problem for scale? So, theoretically, scale forms in places of differences in temperature, and you're always going to have differences of temperature on an espresso machine, whether it's heating up, cooling down, or staying hot. So your st scale should remain the same. So, hopefully not. Exact same level of scale. More water questions over here? Okay, I'm coming around, you guys. Okay, right here in the center. Hello. Uh, how did you make the WBC SCAE spec water? Uh, so I used a group of lab uh, pharmaceutical grade reagents that I mixed together in an anion and a cation solution, so two different solutions. They were basically concentrates of positively charged things that I want to add to the water and the negatively charged things I want to add to the water. And at the last minute, injected them in to bring the water's mineral levels up. Right. And they found a happy medium with each other. 
Oh, I, I, was, I was just wondering, because if I've got 450 ppm water yeah. in my place, and all these things aren't so good, what should I do? Uh, so if you wanted 150 ppm, then a correctly installed reverse osmosis system will be perfect for you. It's always easier to add than it is, it's always easier to take away with water than it is to add. Add is, adding things is quite difficult to have it be consistent and to have it work well. Because removing is straining something. Uh, that's good, I think, but reverse os osmosis is, uh, I think it's illegal in Germany where I come from. <laughs> You're going to find some problems like that. Um, in parts of the United States it is as well, and um, people find a way to install them either way. You, no, I, was, I have to correct on that one, it's not illegal, but you have to look on which one of the technologies. Most of the reverse osmosis are mainly focused to dishwashing machines. These use, are using chemicals to protect their equipment. That's why you cannot use them for food. We are a few manufacturers, Penter among them, who are building RO systems for food applications. So we are not using any chemicals on that one. And we can play with water and reverse osmosis will take out almost all the minerals. And then we have an, an concept of blending with hard water again, which is filtered before, to recreate that optimal water. But we're not going to use chemicals. This way we can produce an RO system which is acceptable for food grade. So this is where you have to look at. Now every time, we mainly also talk about cost of ownership, meaning you have to look, if your water is great, you might not need an RO system. Uh, and, uh, there are technologies which will help you to control and to stabilize your water as well. So it's always looking what you want to do with it and what, what idea and what, how much money you want to spend for it as well. Position yourself. Who am I to say that your water and your coffee is bad? The f reality is that these days, like Tim or all the coffee roasters, we're not staying anymore in our village. We're going globally. We prefer to go globally or to the next country. So if a customer comes to your place and drinks your coffee and finds, wow, great coffee, give me 10 kilos, he goes home, and he got something completely different. He's going to blame you. Your coffee is wrong. You sold me another coffee, quite expensive, than what you get, gave me for tasting. So no, water is very important in that base. So the goal of this is to create somewhere a stability. Like for the WBC, they created a standard. So everybody who's competing all over the world knows which standard we're going to start with. Neutral pH that amount of minerals, hardness, and everything around it, so everybody has the same basics to get on with it. So it's a little bit, little bit the same for you. You have to look on what, how far you want to go, and then there are, there's not a one-shoe-fits-all in this technology, in this world. Oslo doesn't need any RO system. Best case, you want to boost it up a little bit, but you saw it, 50 ppm, great coffees. As a barista, you can cover up a lot of, your co of the water with your coffee. As long as it's not meant to cover up bad things of your coffee, uh, of the water, I mean, then you're bringing out the best of your coffee. You can play with your roasting, your grinding, your tamping, and create that ideal coffee. But you have to be sure that if you promote this, this to other people, and they want to take it back to their place, they can almost recreate that same basics, same standards. And very important in that is the one size does not fit all, and making sure that when you are a consumer of water conditioning equipment, you're a good consumer of water conditioning equipment. Uh, there is a really interesting ethical code of standards written by the WQA. It's something that I really absolutely love. It states that it is really important that when you look at marketing of water filtration, you know what it does by reading the marketing. If you look at the marketing materials from your water filtration, you should be able to tell what the filtration is doing and why you're buying it. If it's, well, water comes in bad and leaves good, and the magic box is in the middle, you probably don't want to buy that because the WQA is that water trade association. We've used that term a couple of times. It's a water quality association. It's the big trade organization of water conditioning equipment, and if somebody's marketing doesn't meet the ethical standards that they give out, I would be very worried. And additionally, always know what you're buying for. If you're buying filtration or conditioning equipment, 
without having tested your water, it seems like you're doing a good job of wasting your money, potentially. And if somebody's going to sell it to you and not at least offer to help you with that, I'd question that relationship. Because you're going to be spending a lot of money over the course of the lifespan of the equipment. Make sure that you buy good equipment that's treating what you need to have treated by testing your water. You have to test your water. Scott, I have a quick question for you. You said that the number four coffee was down to 20 yes. uh, ppm. Number five, where, is that, where does that land so with that the wax? So that stays exactly where it's at. Okay. Uh, what we have done, though, is reduce the alkalinity by a huge amount. We re reduced a little bit the TDS as well, okay. automatically. Reduce the alkalinity, but that number five was great for your taste because lower alkalinity brings up more out of the coffee, but the setup would be killing your machine. So what we want to show also as well is with the traditional technology, sometimes you can go that far that you can create a great coffee, but you create other problems. So it's know your water and know how you're going to treat it. That brings out the best of your coffee. And then the last one with the sodium softener. What That's that ion exchange. So again, about the same. You may lose a little tiny bit, but you're trading the calcium carbonate for a sodium okay. molecule. And that, so, so that's... Okay. Same in, same out. But it does also reduce that alkalinity, the bicarbonates, which means that rate of reaction changes completely, which is why you have a much longer brew period with sodium softeners. Um, okay. If we were all downstairs, that's actually one of my favorite things in all this is, Ronnie, could you tell them about the difference in brew times that we would see down? If you look on, on filter coffee, for example, with sodium softened water compared to the hard, same water but hard water, it can take about 30% longer to get your water through the brew. So for those who know a little bit the gold cup, you got the curve on the extraction. You move that 30% to the right, you get close or way over that point of non-return where you don't want to be of the bitterness of your coffee. So you move everything to the right. So the right water treatment will also play a lot on what you're doing. Question? Uh, not most, so much of a question, but would there be an opportunity for anyone who's interested to taste the water themselves? I mean, I would be very interested to taste the six samples of water as water. I think if they're down there, we could... We could still have some water yeah, left I, over. If they're down there, I think we may What we'll do is out. we'll ask the yeah. circus manager yes. how that could be done, Perfect. if it could be done for everybody. Yes, um, and then that sounds good. If there's a point where we can offer a sample of each of the waters to everybody, then we'll do that. There's another question over here. So we use ROs in our cafes, but we like our, our filter and espresso on different TDS levels. Is there any hardware solution for this other than buying second unit, second oh. RO? So you like the different TDS level? Absolutely. Was that the question? All right, so yes. So what you're doing with your RO system is control it. There's always, when water comes out of an RO system, it, ROs can maybe leave you a small 10, 20, 30 parts per million. To get your mineral level, you're blending back. So you're using a small, very precise valve to mix in some filtered, conditioned water that just hasn't gone through your reverse osmosis system. So if you can have a, a, add an additional line in that you can add with a separate valve back a different amount of hard, taste and odor conditioned, but not reverse osmosis filtered water to your exit water, you'll be able to achieve that. Um, I believe so. Um, I'm not sure what they're sold under, uh, what brand, trade name they're sold under in Europe. I believe the Nimbus makes a system that does that. Does one of the MRSs do that? Uh, our MRS does that as well. The MRS uh, the 600. 600? Yeah. It's delivering two kinds of water. You can play with it. The advantage of the MRS is that reverse osmosis technology is that you are in full control. Compared to, well, there's a reality also in economics. Not everybody has the money or the possibility to invest in an RO system. Then there is the next step, which is the economical financial balance between cost and results. And then you go to filter cartridges. The weak side of filter cartridges is that you're not going to have stability all over the year. Your water will fluctuate. The result will fluctuate as well. With the RO, you can have more control about it. But it's, it's always like... Coming back to that base, how much am I willing to invest? What is it going to cost? Because at the end, yes, water treatment has a cost, but it also helps you save a lot of money. 
and bring out the best quality of your coffee, which is even more important. But you have to look on what is the value for yourself and evaluate that. And something tells me in this group of people who are spending a good amount of money to come here to learn more about their coffee, water conditioning equipment should be very high on your list to make sure you invest in. There's another question here. Uh, hoping this isn't too loaded of a question, but I think uh, I have a little trouble differentiating between hardness and alkalinity. Uh, I think it's probably something that I thought of like interchangeably. Are those, is that sort of like a Venn diagram or are those exclusive? Yeah, so do you want to do this one? I've talked well, a bunch. In, in Europe, we not, amongst baristas, we're not talking about alkalinity. We're talking about carbonate hardness because the market has teach us this. Basically, to make hard scale, or to, to build a wall, you need bricks and cement. The bricks are your scale minerals, the cement is your alkalinity. Together you have hard wall. So that's a little bit how you can easily think about it. Different ways to measure. Now you have to take in consideration, when you have a sodium softener, there's no way to measure the alkalinity or the carbonate hardness in a correct way. Because it's meant to be known as a relation. But if you have no bricks, to build a wall, you can have as much cement as you want. There's no link in between. So this is where qu quite often it goes wrong. Also in the market, we work with grains per gallon, degrees Clark, French degrees, German degrees. They are all related, but quite often they get mixed up one to each other. So make sure if you get measurements that you know what you're talking about. Universally, milligrams per liter or PPM, that's the easiest one. And when you look at that, um, I believe it's all temporary hardness is alkalinity, but not all total hardness is alkalinity. So the combination of temporary hardness and permanent hardness create total hardness, and that can give you a measure of bicarbonates. Any other questions? Jay? Yes. Um, I'll go. Um, there are um, people beside of the coffee industry or not from the coffee industry talking about water in a whole different way. Like they're talking about um, water that shouldn't be um, treated mechanical. Like when you put water out of the earth with a pump, it's death. It's not living anymore. And living water tastes wholly different than this, this me me mechanical used water. Do you know what I mean? And do you have experience there's, there's with that? There's nothing like dead water. Yeah, yeah. They say that the molecules are destroyed and everything. Well, water, water is always alive. Yeah. Um, for example, reverse osmosis, what we call it reverse osmosis, because osmosis is a natural happening. There's a way that water comes from the ground to the top of the trees. That's osmosis. Reverse osmosis, we just put a little more pressure on the other side and reverse it. So we're using the nature to create something more pure. What's left over is not bad. It's just more concentrated. It's like you're, you're in the kitchen, you're making something, you cook it in to make it more concentrated. That's what we do, but we are not, the concentrate is not what we're focused on. We are focused on the rest of it, the purity. So there's nothing like dead water. The purer the water, the more corrosive, the more aggressive it can be if it's not in the right position. So it's the best dissolvent in the world is water. And the best way to think about that is you're never going to find pure water. Never. Closest you're going to get to pure water is as it falls as rain. But the first thing that happens is as a universal solvent, it absorbs some carbon dioxide and is tainted with our carbon dioxide. You're never going to find water in a pure form outside of a laboratory condition because it is such a very good solvent. It's always going to want to pull something from the environment around it, which is why it's so very useful in everything we do and why we need it for life is that it always is looking to find a friend. Water molecules never hang out on their own. Other questions right now? Oh, I, I, here I come. Okay. Jay's better at running. He's not going to fall over. Yeah, I won't fall. Uh, I was just hoping uh, you could let us know how it is you change the acidity or alkalinity of the water. Or if you can. 
Can you repeat, please? Uh, how, how do you change the alkalinity or acidity of the water? How, how do you the, achieve that? Well, the alkalinity, there's different ways. Which the, the purer you make your water, the lower your alkalinity keeps in balance. The other way is the weak acids, resins. Because it's also ion exchange. You take out scale minerals and you give hydrogen instead, which not, it's not making your pH go up, but go down. So this is where you can play with it. Uh, the only thing you have to be concerned is not to go too, way, too much down, because then again you create a very aggressive water. And on the other side of that, to raise your alkalinity, you can use calcite to do that. Can I just ask, uh, straight RO water, you say it's typically around 10 to 30 parts per million. Would that be uh, corrosive on an espresso machine over time? Uh, pretty much, yeah. Um, it'll be, it is, as I said, water is always, the more pure we get it, the more reactive it is. It's going to want to be pulling something out. And whether it be through stainless or brass, whatever it is, it's going to be leaching things from the metal around it, which is less than an ideal circumstance. Do you have any uh, data on how long that time frame would be before that starts happening? Or? Um, you know, I don't have any formal data, but uh, by experience, it, depending on the water, um, LSI, it can happen relatively quickly, matter of months. Thanks. You also have to take in consideration if you would send this kind of water in a copper boiler, you will have a lot of copper ions in your water, which makes you go over the European regulations on concentration of copper. Can I also just ask the uh, WAC filter? What's, what's exactly is that? A, that was an that's ion that exchange filter? That's that weak acid. It's that ion exchange that instead of using a sodium molecule, we're using a hydrogen molecule. So the benefit with that is we're keeping sodium away, but you can, if used too aggressively, lower the pH to a very aggressive level. At, at this level, do you know what the pH is? Uh, 6.2 it was. 6.2 so for be highly the corrosive. weak acid. Yeah, yeah. so what we found was a negative 0.7 LSI. So this was definitely in the corrosive range. Okay. Any other questions? Now, just one correction on the weak acid. Yep. It was already negative and we still had a bypass of more than 30%. Is that it? No more questions? It makes one's brain hurt trying to, when you, when you really think about the different options that you have and how you can take it all away, remineralize, or not even do that at all and use a weak acid. Just having a sliding scale to be able to sort of see what's going to happen when you apply these different uh, technologies, it's, I mean, it's hard to sort of... I mean, that's one of the really great things about finding a great water conditioning professional to work with mm. is somebody who you can say, hey, this is the spec I want to achieve. And I know that I've found my personal preference in water by tasting a bunch of different type, types, mixing to find exactly what I liked, and then writing down that set of water facts. And then I bring it to my water conditioning professional and say, I know how to make coffee really well you know how to make water really well, make me my water. This is what I want to achieve. And if they do it well, they can explain how they're going to do it, why they're doing it, and get you a fairly consistent result. OK. Uh, Christian. Yeah, um, it, it's like the same direction of dead or live water. What um, I read about informed water, like Granda water from Austria. And nobody can really explain it, but you need less um, antibacterial stuff for machines, you know, in CNC machines. It, some some um, you know, hotels and, and, and bars are using it and they say they get better results. Um, do you have any information on that? Can you say anything? I don't that? know that one. What we know is the purer your water is, the more it's going to be accepting everything what's around. Um, luckily, the temperature in our coffee machine is that high, we kill all the bugs. Uh, so that's a big difference about it. But a pure RO water is very receptive. So whatever it would be risk of contamination will hit your system. That's why we also advise for these kind of technologies to have a very closed system, not an open tank, because uh, that might get you in other troubles. 
if I remember correctly, Kagan water is a alkaline water. So mm -hmm. it's one that has a very high alkalinity to it. Yep. And um, from what I've read, and I'm not an expert exactly on high alkaline waters because they don't affect coffee too much, um, there really isn't too many studies that have held up very well with uh, those highly alkaline waters. But I would just suggest reading some more. They're really good. I think science, uh, the journal Science may have published something on that. I'm remembering vaguely. Um, it'd be a good place to start. Okay, you guys look like you have, like we've worn out your capacity here. Is that true? <laughs> Should we give these guys a big round of applause?